right, everyone. Class. Silence. There we go. Can everyone hear all right? Is everyone, can everyone hear, hear me? Okay, good. Uh, I want to um, open this by telling you that I'm Margaret Edwards. I'm performing today as Mistress of Ceremonies. And I'd like to, first of all, say um, we're experiencing a little heat in here. It's not just that the heating system in the library is uh, kaput, but the cooling system in the library is also kaput, and we are reduced to, um, how shall I say, 20th century measures, the fans. So um, I'd like to just put in a word for contributing to the capital campaign that's now underway. Uh, they have already achieved uh, $250,000, but we need 500,000, they say. So um, just letting you know, this is, as it were, a benefit. <laughs> no money, but just announcement, right? First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Adelaide McCracken, the author of this book. Um, that we are celebrating today. And this is the book. Adelaide? Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many friendly faces here. Um, writing this book was a great adventure for me. And without the help of Margaret Edwards, it would not have happened. So much of the work and editing of this book happened right here in this library that it is most fitting that we are meeting here today. I'm honored to present a signed copy of the Tyler Chadwick Letters, Steadfast Love, Forgotten War, to the library's director, Amanda Merck, to be part of the collection of the Norman Williams Public Library. Thank you on behalf of the library and thank you to Margaret for bringing all your wonderful students to us. Thank you so much. We thank will make you. good use of this. Thank you. Uh, I'm just making sure that everyone has a seat and that uh, you understand um, that if you cannot hear, please speak up because there's nothing worse than to have a presentation that you can't hear, right? Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to the speakers today, to the readers rather, today. They will be reading from the Tyler Chadwick Letters. And Stephen Chadwick, uh, his voice is being taken over by uh, Barnard filmmaker Teo Zagar. Teo was also at one point a representative uh, in the Vermont State House. Um, we're very pleased to welcome him to this role. And the person reading the Margaret Tyler side of the correspondence is Margaret Tyler's great-granddaughter. Her name is Chloe Powell, and she is Adelaide McCracken's daughter. Chloe, thank you. Well, you'll see her when she gets up to read. <laughs> um, our story opens in Virginia in 1914. A 17-year-old Virginia Bell named Margaret Tyler, called Little Sister and Little Sis by her family, uh, has met a college senior. He is Stephen Chadwick, often called Chad, during a school holiday from Stuart Hall. Now, he is a college student, and Stuart Hall is a, an academy for women, for ladies, <laughs> and the two have hit it off at Williamsburg, Virginia parties and dances, catching moments to be alone despite the mob of friends and chaperones who surround them. In their letters, you're going to hear mention of a sundial, a yellow dress, and some episode with a snake that's never really made clear, but a snake episode. All have great significance for the couple because in a very short interval, Margaret and Chad have forged a bond. Now, we in our day would think that their dates are laughably trivial. Um, one chaste kissed, no fondling, and certainly no intimate sexual contact has transpired between them. They have danced, but they have really built their romance out of gossamer. 
So here is Stephen. He's at Murphy's Hotel in Richmond, Virginia, where he is staying. He anticipates returning next day to his college, Washington and Lee in Lexington, Virginia. Very soon he will graduate with a law degree. Then he must return home, which means for him traveling all the way across the United States to the state of Washington. He's expected by his parents in Olympia, Washington, the state capital. His father is a lawyer like Margaret's father, and he is a judge. Specifically, he is the chief justice of the Supreme Court of the state of Washington. Chad's mother, like Margaret's mother, is a power to be reckoned with. She rules the roost at home. And here is Chad. June 13th, 1914. My dear Margaret, you talk about getting the blues all over. Believe me, when it came to leaving Williamsburg and you, it just took all the fortitude I could muster together to hold myself up. I have often thought that that little inexplicable feeling was not in my makeup, but today and last night and the days before I could feel it coming, and on that last goodbye it was there. I couldn't escape it. Never before in my short and uneventful life has it been that I couldn't face the music, but it was all I could do to see you. Life is full of these little separations and also of its reunions. So as the memory haunts me, I may get back. No, not that. I will get back to Virginia, and our little affair will not be over. I reckon I had better take a little walk before train time, a train that with every click over the rails will take me that much farther away from my new-made friends and from my first real affair of the heart. I leave tonight to be in Lexington till Wednesday, then Olympia. Love, SF Chadwick. Margaret receives and reads this letter at a large manor house. It's called Sherwood Forest. Her family's Virginia plantation was the original home of her grandfather, John Tyler, President of the United States from 1841 until 1845. Many of you will remember Tippy Canoe and Tyler too from your American history books. Uh, her, Margaret's father is Judge David Gardner Tyler. Her older sister Mary is called Mamie. Her two younger brothers are Gardner and Alfred. June 15th, 1914. Dear Chad, you didn't ask me to call you Chad, but I like it, and I hope you have no objection. Williamsburg was horribly dull after you left, but I managed to stand it until the next morning. Everybody had a lovely time that evening reminding me of your episode with the snake, each person telling me as if it were something new. I suppose you're in Lexington now, receiving your degree with all due honor. I hope this letter will reach you before you leave and start on your trip across the continent. I find the quiet country is rather pleasant after the excitement of the past week. Nothing to do but lie around and try to keep cool. The Friday before I left Williamsburg, some friends and I walked over to the gym and found it dark and gloomy, and also around by the sundial, but somehow I couldn't bear to stay there. It brought back too many memories. Wishing you a great deal of pleasure during your travels and a safe arrival home. Always yours, Margaret. Lexington, Virginia, Delta Phi fraternity, fraternity at the College of Washington and Lee. June 16th, 1914. My dear Margaret, I received your letter today. It seemed like new life in this blaze of final week. Tomorrow I get my degree, and the next day sees me started on my way home. It almost kills me to think of leaving the country of sundials, snakes, and all the repertoire of reminders of some of the best days of my life. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, but I believe I have reached the superlative degree of that sensation already. I am just before being a wreck. Ten dances with one all-night session, all in the space of one week, is too much for my good health. Our dances here have not held the same fascination as those at William and Mary. When you are just dancing to dance and not to get a chance to see the certain lady, why the dancing loses its pleasure. I am just sort of an accommodation performer up here, helping out some Kappa Epsilon ladies on making up their dance cards. All the time I am out, my thoughts drift around to sundials and yellow dresses, 
and that sad goodbye. And then I say to myself, young Chad, you've got it bad. With love, yours, S.F. Chadwick. June 19th, 1914, en route from Baltimore to New York. My dear Margaret, well, we had quite a time at Washington and Lee, Washington and, Lee and 11 o'clock last night was the first sleep I've had since Wednesday morning. To wit, 39 hours without sleep and 13 dances in two weeks, and you know I'm dead. This is a, this is a fast train, but a rough one. I got my degree packed away in my trunk, so now there is not a chance to stop me from proclaiming that I have an LLB. However, that doesn't change me, nor in any way stop my dreaming, which, it seems, is all that I have left to do. I put as a limit three years. I think I should be able to scrape up a fee or two in that time. Then back I'll come on the fastest, most direct train possible. Always your Chad. Olympia, Washington, June 30th, 1914. My dear Margaret, home an hour ago. Father is on the bench, so I have not seen him as yet. I was afraid that if I went into the courtroom, it might cause a smile and rattle the lawyers. I am home today and expect to go to work tomorrow, some speed. I will take the afternoon off today and enjoy my vacation. My work, though, should be enjoyable. I have just taken possession of Dad's office, borrowed a key, and broke in. I am anxious to see what he has to say. Hope when I get home, I will be fortunate enough to receive a letter from you. And believe me, yours, Chad. Olympia, Washington, July 5th, 1914. My dear Margaret, I was mighty sorry to hear about your eyes and certainly appreciate your writing. Hope by this time you are recovered. I am writing this ere I retire, and since I have been in the country fishing this morning, tennis this evening, and a call with the folks at the governor's mansion, why, judge me not harshly. My work started the day after I got home. As nobody knows exactly what I am supposed to do, I can say I am my own boss with a very good salary and expenses. Light work and a boss who likes to take me away early to play golf with him. I expect to be on the road next week. Now don't accuse me of forgetting my friends in Virginia. I went to a dance and my mind was 3,000 miles away. Well, as the hour groweth late and I am a working man, I needs must close. Yours, Chad. Chad and Margaret correspond back and forth for a few months, but then the frequency of their letters slows down and after a while stops. Why? In a casual offhand way, Margaret has written that she had allowed one of the young men she was seeing to give her a pin, P-I-N. Chad misinterpreted this and felt she was gently telling him goodbye. During Chad's first year at home, he enrolled at the University of Washington. Several years pass, and after eventually graduating with a doctoral degree, he then joins a well-established law firm in Seattle. Meanwhile, Margaret, baffled by why he has stopped writing, uh, spent her senior year at Stewart Hall. She must have been also hurt by Stephen Chadwick's eventual silence. In her mind, no one else could take his place, and the pen incident to her was just a bit of casual banter, a way of teasing a local suitor that she was holding at arm's length. Margaret wrote a poem inspired by her romance with Stephen Chadwick, and she submitted it to her Stuart Hall annual. It was published. She didn't send it to him. Reflected light. Sweetheart, when I looked into your eyes, I saw within them shining such a light as I had never seen in earth or skies, translucent, lustrous, marvelously bright. But when I gazed into their depths again, they were illuminated by a light divine, the light of love, and something told me then that the same radiance was a glow in mine. In spite of her having good friends at Stuart Hall, Margaret was homesick her senior year. Her sister Mamie had graduated the year before, and Margaret missed not having her sister at school with her. 
Each winter, the Tyler family moved from the quiet countryside of Sherwood Forest to socially active Williamsburg, and Margaret was then bombarded with letters from her mother and from her sister Mamie describing debutante Mamie's unending parties and dances and all the fun that Margaret was missing. Margaret received just one letter from Chad during her final school year, and this was the letter. University of Washington, Seattle, February 9th, 1915. My dear Margaret, here is a quote from the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing. And thus it is with time and my belated letter. I had a most enjoyable trip to San Francisco at Christmas, saw the fair, which was nearing completion, and visited friends. San Francisco is a great city, and I place it second only to Williamsburg as a place to celebrate New Year's. But with all its white lights, I was remembering my last New Year's Eve little party at Getty's and the friends I made there. I go home this weekend to the governor's daughter's debut, which promises to be quite an affair. I attended the legislative ball in Olympia two weeks ago, and I took part in all of the motley dancing, everything from two-step and waltz to the foxtrot. Wish I were in Virginia this year as I was last, but I have to content myself with looking east over the snow-capped Cascades. I hope that, by possibility, I may not be entirely forgotten. Yours, S.F. Chadwick. Margaret graduated from Stuart Hall in 1915, June of that year. School having ended, she came home to live with her family. College wasn't part of the life of the Tyler girls. Uh, the boys would go, of course, but Margaret, like her sister Mamie, had her year as a debutante. She traveled often, accompanied by her mother, between the city of Richmond and her family's country estate, Sherwood Forest, and the city of Williamsburg, where her family had recently bought a house. World War I had begun by this time in Europe, but the war at first must have seemed very far away to Virginians. Life there was probably not much affected until the United States entered the war in April of 1917. That's when Margaret and Mamie began to see their friends and their cousins joining the Army and Navy, heading off to training camps and then to France to fight in the trenches. At this point, Margaret hadn't heard from Stephen Chadwick for almost three years. In December of 1917, she sent him a Christmas card addressed to his parents' house in Olympia. The printed card read simply, to wish you a Merry Christmas for old time's sake. And it was signed quite formally, Margaret G. Tyler. Christmas Eve, 1917. My dear Margaret, no card of the season brought more joy to my heart than yours and the memories it revived. In truth, I thought we had probably placed ourselves so far on foreign seas that we would never locate one another again. For the past two years, I have been in the practice of law in Seattle and just reaching the place where a trip east was a possibility when the war clouds broke and, having broke, I had to step out in the rain. I got busy right away and am now a first lieutenant of Inf infantry at Camp Lewis, American Lake, Washington, officer's training battalion, barracks number three. And, if you see fit, an honest-to-goodness letter would seem mighty good. I expect to be moving east and to France within four months, and if time allows, a hurried trip to Virginia, provided Uncle Sam grants the time, is my fondest hope. My kindest regards to all your people and my best wishes to you for the new year. Without change, SF Chad. From Sherwood Forest in Holcroft, Virginia, January 16th, 1918. My dear Chad, your letter forwarded from Williamsburg took me back three or four years, and I was mighty glad to know something of you again. I was not at all surprised to hear that you're a first lieutenant. I felt sure that you would be with the colors and an officer. I suppose you're anxious to go over there and get a slap at Kaiser Bill. Now that you've mentioned the possibility of a short visit to this state on your way, 
I shall be disappointed unless you do make it. A more immediate question, can't you send me a picture of yourself in uniform? That would be the next best thing to seeing you. We're now living in our country place between Richmond and Williamsburg. There's just been a terribly cold spell, and the James River has been frozen for the, past, for the first time since 1899. Fine for skating, but not for traffic. Our mails have been tied up for several days on account of the ice, and this is the second letter I've tried to get off to you. I would give you a brief history of myself during the past four years, but can think of no very important events to narrate. Things that seemed important at the time are not so in retrospect. I've not changed a bit. As ever, Margaret. And during the next six months, the correspondence takes off. Many letters fly between these two. Even though fly is figurative, for all the cross-country mail back then had to rely on the railroad. They exchange gifts. Chad sends her a Chinese box. Margaret knits him a pair of socks. Their trust and their love grows until, between them, there is no more hesitance or doubt. Camp Fremont, California, June 12th, 1918. My dear Margaret, if you think it's hot in Virginia, you might try it here where the mercury says it's 102 under the shade of a live oak. But we don't drill under a live oak. I would say that the last four days it has been 120 on our drill field, with 10 minutes rest in the morning, none in the afternoon. I can't stay in my tent until about 11 p.m. It's like an oven. I'm glad you liked the Chinese box. Our division is receiving a house cleaning. All our captains are being made majors, and we are suffering under the loss of our colonel, who returns to Manila for duty. And, oh yes, more gossip. General Morrison's wife is buying a car. Said she wanted a cheap one as she would have opportunity to use it only three months. So we may be here that long. I, or we, don't know a thing about it and pick up each idle rumor, amplify and improve it. There is only one thing real in the whole business, and tis this. I'm here and you are there, and how to change the situation is the problem. With me, it's a, it's a thousand and one things I want to say and one question to ask. I know myself and, could I only feel it fair to you, I would, before going over, submit my proposal for consummation at your pleasure. Whether a soldier in the army at this time is wild to consider such a thing, I cannot say. I've debated it in my mind for weeks. My life is at the disposal of our country, yet my heart and all I do is yours. Were we not at war, I would have been in Virginia before this. Now I daily fear I'll not go to Europe by way of the East Coast. <coughs> I would like to know your thoughts, my dear, on long distance engagements. There, Chad, you have done, gone, and went and done it. Forever <laughs> yours, Chad. Camp Fremont, June 16th. 1918. My dear Margaret, you know correspondence over such a distance as ours, when one feels as I do, is one of the additional hells I'm going to tell Dante about. To write you such a question and have to wait three weeks for an answer is an ordeal to compare with the worst. Regardless of your views, which I know you will voice, I purpose to be insistent to the end. I do want some claim on you before I leave. Whenever you are ready, you can inform me of your ring size. An engagement may be now, it may be later. That's for you to decide. But I'm the same man I used to be, though a few years have made some improvements, I think. Were I with you this, were I with you, this would be oh so much easier, but I'm not. Don't, please don't, laugh outright. Just smile and say, well, if he wants to go ahead, I'll let him. Do you ask, what sort of a lawyer is he? What are his professional associations? Well, no one had a brighter future to leave for war. I am with one of the leading firms in Seattle and in the West. I am popular with its members and assured of a future in the firm when the war is over. I am still rated as a part of it. My name is still on the door and letterhead. I believe I would be willing to be examined by your good father on my possibilities in that field. The night I walked the campus of William and Mary all night to see you off, you didn't go because perhaps you would see me if you left on the later train. 
I can only say that if now I could not express my love with a clear conscience and with a firm confidence that I can make the future worthy of you, I would never have expressed it, though I have loved you always. As ever, Chad. Sherwood Forest, June 28, 1918. My dear Chad, I know you are happy that the 8th is beginning to move. A lady seeing your picture on my dresser remarked innocently, that young man is going to get what he wants, I can tell to look at him, or something to that effect. And she's right. When a man like you offers his heart, there's not but one thing for a girl to do. What I'm doing now. Your talk about your letter being hard work of a new kind, well, this is brand new work for me, too. And if I didn't have your letter right by me to look at every now and then, I doubt if I'd have the courage to go on. Not that I don't know my mind, don't think that for a minute. What I mean is it's hard to say in a letter with such a wall of silence between. You understand, and it's even worse for a girl who's never had to do it before. Anyway, I feel as if it were hardly any use for me to tell you. I'm sure you must have known it all the time. I gave my heart away in the year 1914, so it doesn't seem worthwhile to go through that again. I was only 16 then, but you made such a lasting impression on me that ever since, I've compared all other men with you and have never really cared about anyone else. I've had affairs and thought now and then I was crazy about someone, but there was always something lacking because I'd known you before. I wanted to tell you all this before you go. I don't suppose you're leaving quite yet, but letters take so long and I didn't want to take any chances. Now it's all over and done and it wasn't so bad after all. I suppose now I'm engaged and somehow I ought to feel different but I'll have to keep reminding myself that I really am engaged, for you see, I'm just exactly the same, because I've loved you always. And I always will. Remember that when you're across the ocean. As ever, Margaret. Camp Fremont, California, July 5th, 1918. My dear, now I know I don't have to inform you as to who is the happiest man in the country. Never has the sun risen so fair as this morning when it found me reading your letter of confession. It's the happiest day of my life. Your answer was worth waiting for, and I'm doubly glad I didn't have to wait any longer than I did. Dame Rumor says we moved the last week in this month, so I did not take the leave in hopes that my chances of getting to the east will be better. I just wait naturally. I just naturally cannot go over without seeing you. The end of the war can wait a day. With all, Orders is orders, painful though they be. From what you say, you should be able to know just what you have been to me for the past four years, the one girl in the world by whom all others were to suffer by comparison. Well, Margaret, I must let mother in on a bit of the best news in the world. Again, I love you, Chad. And with your permission, may I pen a letter to your father? Sherwood Forest, July 30th, 1918, Sunday night. My dearest Chad, this has been a busy day with church morning and evening. But even if the day has been wearing, I've thought about you just the same, and I'm afraid I was thinking more about you than about the service. Oh, shameful thing to admit. But honest confession is good for the soul. Papa has your letter. He's been very uncommunicative to me. Hates to face facts, I think except to grumble something about the nerve of these young men who want to take a man's daughter away from him. <laughs> but Mother said he liked your letter, and I'm sure he'll write you in due time. I want him to be pleased, but no matter what he says, it's too late. I'm exactly 21, though few know it, and the family never seems to realize it. I haven't liked it much myself until now. It makes me feel secure. I knew you would write a letter that he'd like in spite of himself. I know nobody who could do it but you. My friends have always stood in mortal terror of Papa. Papa told Mother that I must see you again before, that I, before I could know. Older people forget what rom romance is, and they don't seem to realize that the most beautiful thing about ours is that even though we haven't seen each other, we still have faith. And so he said he would invite you to pay us a visit. Of course, you've been waiting for that. Do come. I want to see you more than anything in the world, but whether I see you or not, I love you. As ever, Margaret. 
Sherwood Forest, July 30th, 1918. My very dearest, the ring is here on my left hand and proud. Well, all the superlatives in the language would give you a poor idea. I know I'm the happiest girl that ever wore a solitaire, and my only regret is that you couldn't be here to fit it on my finger yourself. But someday you must go through that ceremony just as if there had been no preliminaries. It's the most beautiful ring in all the world, the purest, whitest diamond I ever saw, and I'm so glad it's gold. I wouldn't be such a slacker as to wear platinum now. It seems as if someone must always bring you back to earth when you're walking on air, and today it was Papa. Just before it came, he gave me the benefit of a common sense talk. He was gentle but firm in his conviction that an engagement at this time and distance is a bad idea. His chief objection being that when we see each other again, one of us might be disappointed, and that poor unfortunate would feel bound to go through with it. I assured him that neither of us would be so foolish as to expect that from the other, and that it went without saying we would always be perfectly frank. His idea is that we could have some sort of understanding instead of an engagement. I don't see what difference it makes which we call it, but if it pleases him better, superfluous as it seems, we will put this into words. We are bound to each other only as long as we both care as much as we do think we do now. I think he will write you something to that effect, so would prepare you. Of course he has our interests as he sees them in mind, but it is rather a damper, and having just heard it, I thought it best not to show him the ring, which would be about the same as saying, see, we didn't wait for your consent. And mother advises me to wait until he feels differently before I flash it at him. Every few seconds, I must stop and view the ring on my hand from every angle, and then I take it off and put it in the case and set it up before me. Anybody watching me from a distance and not knowing what I'm looking at would certainly think me a fit object for a sanatorium. The ring grows more beautiful every time I look at it and will never fade into nothingness, but be a joy forever, something tangible to show me I'm not just dreaming. It's the next best thing to having you here, and I think of it as your love in concrete form. Papa may call it an engagement, a betrothal, or an understanding. I like the first, but it's all the same to me. Being yours for always, Margaret. P.S. Now it's Monday, July 31st. I didn't get this letter off, and I'm glad to be able to tell you that a dear letter came from your mother today. I know I'm going to be crazy about your whole family, I knew I would love them because they're your family, and now I know I will love them for themselves, too. Camp Fremont, California, August 7th, 1918. My dearest Margaret, much news. Yesterday morning, I was awakened at 3 a.m. to prepare a list of 92 men from the company for immediate overseas service. It may be France, it may be Russia, or whatnot. I should know by night and will add it to this letter. All they have said so far, it will be very interesting and will require good men. I stand well here, but since I am not to be promoted, I want to get into action as soon as possible and lend my power to ending the thing. Remember, as the song says, distance only lends enchantment, though the ocean waves divide. Your letter of the ring is here, and I am happy your judgment is right. I am here to state that I, with you, will respect your father's wishes and call it an understanding. In fact, I am agreeable to any camouflage necessary, but with all I know I have had my heart set from the day I met you on some day telling you so and hoping for a favorable reply. And now I have realized my desire and cemented it. Though we will go through it someday as a ceremony, between ourselves nothing more is necessary. And should it be that on closer scrutiny I am not the man you would have me be, God forbid. You may tell me, and I will withdraw. It's Siberia. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And this division is to follow. Margaret, I want more than anything to see you. That's the main reason I signed, so I could get east earlier. But I'm on the detail and go to augment the 27th and 31st as expeditionary force to Siberia. It's a 25-day trip at the best, and it means for 50 days you will not hear from me, nor I from you. I think we will leave Saturday, but I will wire you and you will know before you get this. 
Somewhere in Siberia, guarding some ammunition dump, or having pistol practice in Vladivostok, will be a heart that has but three thoughts. The end of the war, home, and you. All my love, Chad. Sherwood Forest, August 15, 1918. My dearest Chad, a thunderbolt certainly came with your letter today. I hadn't taken the possibility of its being Siberia at all seriously, so you can imagine the surprise. I think mother expected me to take it as a great sorrow and went to tears, but I'm not sorrowful. I think it's the most exciting, thrilling thing that has happened since we declared war, and it will certainly be one of the greatest. I don't know much about Siberia, but I'm going to read up on it, and I've never attempted to understand the Russian situation, not having a vital interest in it before. I'm so proud of you. To think of you being in command of 1,200 or more men, and I know that the responsibility is not too much for you. While most of the girls I know have lovers in France, I don't know of anyone else who can boast of one on the Siberian expedition. I did want terribly to see you before you went and couldn't help harboring, harboring a sneaky little hope that you might come this way. I don't care how many years it is, I will always love you the same. And if you think that there is a chance that I could possibly change when I see you again, I'm not worth loving. I suppose you're already on the ocean and that the long time that there has to be before I can hear from you has begun. I'm going to miss your letters terribly, but though you're exiled to Siberia and the Pacific is between us, I feel I am more fortunate than most girls would be under the circumstances because I've had years to prepare and I've already known what it is to be separated. I hope to get one more letter from you before the curtain of silence falls. Good wishes from all my family. Remember that I love you more than anything in the world, and God bless you, Chad. Devotedly, Margaret. Margaret and Chad needn't have worried that they wouldn't still be in love when they met again. When he left Siberia, Chad, unscathed, returned to Washington State. Then, as soon as he could, he headed straight to Virginia. There, these two were married at Sherwood Forest on July the 2nd, 1919. The bride was 22, the groom was 25. Here is Margaret, writing to her father while on her honeymoon trip west with her new husband. The letter is dated 100 years from tomorrow. July 10th, 1919. Glacier Park, Montana. My precious daddy, I'm really out west now. Our hotel faces the Rockies, which are just as wonderful as I've always imagined them to be. So rugged, they seem to be all chopped up in snow. Sure enough, snow in the crevices. We're so high up that when I first got here, there was a funny sort of ringing in my ears, but I have become accustomed to the altitude now. It was horribly hot all day crossing Mon Montana, until suddenly we came upon the mountains. This park seems to be the gateway to the Rockies. We slept perfectly comfortably last night under heavy Indian blankets. We have Indian rugs too, and wigwams and totem poles outside. The hotel is most attractive, roughly finished and with huge Douglas fir trees grown in Washington state for columns inside and out, and immense fireplaces built of stone, and on the walls great grizzly bear skins and heads of bison and deer. In the dining room, the waitresses are dressed in Swiss peasant costumes, and you think you must be in the Alps, and I truly don't see how the Alps could be grander. Chad says the scenery here is not any more beautiful than that of our future home. Oh, I do hope some of us will strike a gold mine someday and you and Mama can come out. I'm coming back just as soon as Chad can send me. I love our dear Virginia more and more and my beautiful home and precious family that I left behind. We leave here day after tomorrow and reach Seattle the night of the 14th. With a heart full of love to you and to all I am, your devoted little sis. Well, that ends the letters, uh, what we're going to quote today. Of course, in the book, uh, the letters are uh, certainly a great deal more numerous and um, more interesting, um, too, in certain ways.
But that gives you the outline of their romance and their fulfillment of that romance. And uh, their marriage lasted their lives. And uh, Margaret um, lived out in Seattle, and um, Adelaide remembers going and visiting her grandparents there. I'm going to give you just a little bit of historical background uh, because I think that most of us don't really know, or I certainly didn't know before uh, Adelaide began her book, I didn't know that the uh, United States was in Siberia during World War I. Who knew that? I was uh, busy reading about uh, France and Germany and England and our involvement in Europe, but I certainly didn't know anything about what was going on in Asia. So I thought I would write up this little um, bit of historical background. Why was Chad sent to Siberia instead of France? This makes sense when we reflect that in 1917, President Woodrow Wilson wanted Americans to fight only in Europe. He did not want another theater of war opening up on Russia's Asian flank. So he sent a special expeditionary force, as he called it, to keep the peace between a number of angry factions, many of whom were considered America's allies. Some allies, you didn't need enemies. <laughs> they were so difficult to deal with. The year 1917 was the date of Russia's revolution, as we all recall. At that time, Chad, um, when Chad slips off to Siberia, excuse me, not slips off, ships off to Siberia, sorry, in August of 1918, the Tsar's army, called the White Russians, had been given a boost by the Czechoslovak Legion, who had taken the Trans-Siberian Railway back uh, from the Red Army. Russia was internationally, I mean, in, not internationally, but internally falling apart, and Japan, smelling blood in the water, so to speak, sent troops into Siberia to see if there was any possibility of carving off some territory. The Japanese had hired the Cossacks to work as their henchmen, uh, torturing and murdering Russian citizens. England and France were also in Siberia, their goal being to fight Bolshevism. Other countries with troops in Siberia were China, Canada, Italy, and Poland. Woodrow Wilson's orders were that American troops stay strictly neutral and not support either the red or the white Russians. These days, historians advance the idea that World Wars I and II were the same war with, you know, a 20-year uh, hiatus between them. In Europe, in 1917, France and England, we all remember, were deeply engaged in repelling Germany. If we think of that conflict as being center stage, then in this theater of war, the wings are Siberia. That's where the other major players stood around rehearsing their lines for World War II. The American soldiers, Chad among them, were sent there to keep the peace. So Chad was not in a muddy trench in Europe being shot at and gassed. He was enduring hardships, but nothing lethal. His service had always had the potential to turn into warfare, and he and his fellow soldiers were fully armed, fully trained, but what he mostly encountered was cold and hunger, just garden variety cold and hunger. Siberia, as we all know, is frightfully cold, even if you are somewhat sheltered. In his first few months in Siberia, Chad was living in officer's quarters, and officer's quarters was an unheated railroad boxcar guarding the Trans-Siberian Railroad. His food and drink were highly variable, from the best to the worst, from good to really bad, and sometimes not any food at all. In this bleakest of landscapes, Chad was troubled to see the intense suffering of the surrounding peasant population. He witnessed the cruelty of the Cossacks to the general population, cruel, and also to each other, for they were divided into factions and they loved murdering their rivals. And the Japanese, of course, meanwhile, were kept on creating diplomatic intrigues. Everyone was jumpy, everyone was at sword's point, and yet, in general, the Americans had limited success. They managed to quell some of the conflicts and they kept the trains running. Chad wrote Margaret as often as he could from Siberia, but he was aware that his letters would be heavily censored. Margaret was therefore given only an airbrushed, though charmingly vivid, account of his soldier's life. And here is an excerpt from a letter he wrote to her in March of 1919.
six months in Siberia, completed at last. The variety of service I have had, the different individual experiences, the dealings with the different races and nationalities, has been the privilege of few soldiers in this war. Yesterday, I went down to a Chinese bathhouse, then called with Lieutenant Rice, who speaks Chinese, on a Chinese merchant who had a Korean wife, stopped in at a Petrograd restaurant to talk to the Italian who keeps the piano and the Czech who plays the violin there. After, we went to a Russian movie and saw a French play, stopping on the way home to have a ham sandwich in a Hindu cafe. And a block from home, Rice took me in to visit a Russian family who are friends of his. That's variety as you find it here. In the Russian home, one of the poorer type, but very clean, they kept chickens, pigeons, and geese in separate pens in the kitchen. I had wondered where they all were during the coldest days of the winter, but I had not suspected the truth. The U.S. troops expected to be sent home after the Allied victory in Europe, which happened, of course, on November 17, 1918. Chad was lucky to be one of the first Americans to leave Siberia, and he left in April 1919, because after he left, circumstances became much more dangerous for the Americans. The expeditionary force remained in Siberia, however, until April of 1920. Then, after the white Russian government fell, the Bolsheviks took over Siberia, the Americans left. Peacekeeping is, by its very nature, rarely dramatic. No victorious battles, no belligerent advances of an enemy being repelled. And this means no heroes and not many good war stories to tell at home. Understandably, historians are not attracted to writing much about what did not happen. And that's why we today know relatively little about Siberia in World War I. The history's there, of course, it's just not considered very interesting, except one of the virtues of this very fine book is how Chad's letters, combined with Adelaide's research, has made this particular chapter of American history quite fascinating. Adelaide's going to now tell you briefly about how she created this book. And after that, there's going to be refreshments, as you see over there, cake, cider, and um, there's going to be book sales here. She will explain. Thank you, Margaret, and the Woodstock Learning Lab and the library for putting on this beautiful event. And thank you, Chloe and Teo, for coming here and reading. And thank you all for being here today. I'm really honored that you all came out to hear about the book. And um, I'm also very grateful that my grandparents saved the letters, that my grandmother saved the letters throughout her life especially the correspondence from her courtship with my grandfather that makes up this book. Uh, my mother had told me about the letters, but I had never seen them, and for several years after my parents' death, uh, the letters were missing. Uh, the pr priceless collection was ultimately found in my sister Margaret McCracken and my brother-in-law Tim Turner's barn in January of 2013. This happened about a week before I began taking Margaret Edwards' Learning Lab writing course at the Norman Williams Public Library. Um, she teaches not only memoir writing, but about writing family histories, too. And this, the timing of the find, finding of the letters turned out to be providential. Um, the letters were compelling reading. And I began to transcribe them right away using Dragon voice recognition software. I would read the letters out loud, and the text appeared on the computer pages in Microsoft Word. Some editing was necessary, but the software made the transcription process relatively easy. I showed the letters to Margaret Edwards as I was transcribing them, and she edited as she read them, read through them. She soon su suggested to me that my grandparents' story would be a good book. I agreed, but never thought that I had it in me to put a book together. Uh, it's thanks to Margaret's encouragement and support through every step of the process that the correspondence finally did become a book. I also got a lot of support from my family and friends. 
and uh, critiques from Margaret and the other writers in her group were invaluable to me and regular deadlines created by her classes uh, really helped me stay on track. It became evident right, right away that I needed to explain some historical background. At the, um, and for the most part, the letters tell the story, but some additional information was needed, especially the story of the Allied intervention in Siberia, which is a part of history unknown to many. Um, as far as doing research is concerned, the internet is a remarkable resource, uh, one that we didn't have when I was young. Um, early in my trying to learn about the Siberian intervention, I googled the name of an obscure battle that I had come across, and looking at the website that came up, I was surprised to come across my grandfather's name, Stephen Chadwick. There was an interesting story about the division he commanded getting food poisoning a day or two after they arrived in Vladivostok, uh, something that he hadn't said anything about in the letters. It turned out that the author of the website, a stamp collector named Edith Falstitch, had become interested in that era of history because of the postmarks from the period, and in the 1950s, she got in touch with as many of the veterans as she could find from the American Expeditionary Forces in Siberia. Um, she used their letters and stories uh, to write a history of the Allied intervention from the, soldiers, from the American soldiers' point of view. Uh, my grandfather, Stephen Chadwick, was one of the first soldiers she located. Falstitch self-published her book, and many years later, her granddaughter posted it online as a blog. Um, the website indicated that all of the material that she had accumulated was saved at the Hoover in Ar Institute Archives at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Uh, my first instinct was to rush right out there, but the timing wasn't good for that, and I was able to hire a research assistant through the library. Um, she was a Russian graduate, graduate student named Natalia Reshetova, and she emailed me documents from the collection that she photographed with her cell phone. Uh, there was a folder titled with my grandfather's name, which contained correspondence between my grandfather and Falstitch, as well as some documents that my grand, grandfather had written later about his memories of the war. These were stories that he had not been able to write about in his censored letters, and they gave me a fuller understanding of his experience in Siberia. The process of researching and writing the history was fascinating to me, but quite outside of my comfort zone. I'd majored in art history at college and had never had to write about such things as wars and political movements. Uh, the situation in Siberia was so complex with so many players who all had such different goals that I could hardly keep an account straight in my mind, let alone get it down on paper. But I think that finally I was able to explain the gist of what went on in Siberia during the intervention. Self-publishing was also a new experience for me. Uh, by the time the book was written, five and a half years after I'd started it, I didn't want to take the time to submit the manuscript to publishers and most likely face rejection. Also, I was getting impatient to see the whole in print, so I went the self-publishing route. I was so lucky to have Edith Wright as the designer of the interior of the book and David Powell to design the cover. Both gave me excellent advice and did a beautiful job. I am so pleased with the look of the finished book. Um, as for photographs for the book, I had a certain number for the family, but I didn't have much to illustrate the Siberian part of the story. My grandfather had brought back only a few, few blurry images from Siberia. But the Hoover Institute archives at Stanford had a number of extensive photograph collections from the era, so I headed out there last summer, accompanied by my sister Sarah Norcross. I couldn't have done it without Sarah. We spent three days in the archives looking at thousands of photos. Uh, we were specifically looking for pictures of our grandfather, and we found a few that could have been him, but nothing definite. We did find wonderful photos to illustrate the book, and I must say it made me feel like a real researcher to spend time in that library. 
we came home with a very good idea of what the Allied intervention in Siberia looked like. So that's the end of what I have planned to say, but we're, we have refreshments over here now, and I will be glad to speak to you and answer questions afterwards. And copies of my book are for sale over there for the uh, bargain price of $25 per copy. And I, again, I thank you all for coming. Thank you.